I don't think you could be in a better place today. I know you've heard that a thousand times. Let me tell you briefly why. You have basically two ways to live life. You can live life by the secular model, or you can live life by the spiritual model. And if you live it by the spiritual model, then some new vistas are going to open, new understanding, new experiences. Secular model, well, it can be okay, but it comes to a hard end right there at the grave, and then it really gets hard. I hope in this series of lessons to give you about, what is that going to be, six lessons, I think. So six little slices of what it involves the spiritual life. And if I can work this right, we're going to talk about a full scholarship, if you would. And I'm going to turn around and read some because this is my outline, basically. And so if you want a copy of it, I do have it. And I'm going to try to stay within six feet of the podium or the microphone or something. That's going to be tough, but we'll make it work. So I want you to notice that Jesus was teaching. After he had done his teaching, the people were just astounded. They were astonished. And they were going like, this guy teaches like nobody we've ever seen before. He's got something special going on. And I want you to think about that for a moment, but forget about the robes and the sandals, right? How do you see Jesus? Every one of us. Did you grow up with a picture Bible or a storybook? And Jesus always had what? Got a beard? And he had long hair. And, and back in the 60s, that's what we used to argue about. Well, Jesus had long hair. Now, we only dream about long hair. We don't give that much thought anymore. I want you to think of a modern classroom, something along that line. I want you to think about the visual aids, the marker board, maybe a PowerPoint, maybe some visuals on the wall, and maybe some library books sitting around and about. That's the idea I want you to think about because where are we at today? Last time I saw somebody in a robe and sandals, it was either a play or they're a little bit questionable standing on a street corner. You know what I mean. So I'm going to go with our, our modern analogy here. So what we have is we have some students that are really eager to get it. You know the ones. Now, I've never taught public school, so I don't have a clue what I'm talking about. But I got an idea there are some of those students that are on the edge of their seat and they're really wanting to get it. And I never understood those students. And then you have your mediocre students. That was where I fell in. I was a C student. If I got a C, I was like, woohoo, I'm not grounded. And then I was going out to play with my slingshot. That was the 1960s. And I was like, woohoo, I'm not grounded. Give me my PS4, my Xbox, or whatever the next thing is going on today. So you got your mediocre students, and, and they're just there. And in church analogy, they're there to pay their fire insurance. I just really kind of got to be here. I got to graduate. I got to get the grade. You know, if I don't get a job, blah, blah, blah. But their heart's not desperately into it. And then we have what we're going to call our problem students. These are the guys who are looking to pick an argument with a teacher. They are somehow going to show the teacher wrong and they're going to disrupt the class and they're going to be the class clown and, and those kind of things. And you, I don't know how you get around that. That seems just to be pretty much a lot of what we have going on in society and churches. And then we have our teacher. And there are a few teachers out there still who are dedicated, they're passionate, they love the students, they love the idea of teaching, and they want to impart what knowledge they have into those young minds and help shape and mold them into something that's going to be better and stronger and add to the future. And this teacher loves it all so much that he, or in our example, you could say she, but obviously we're going to be connecting with Christ here in a moment, paid a scholarship for everybody. Everyone gets to attend this class, this school for free. Isn't that wonderful? But this isn't a kindergarten class, okay? This is more like, don't you think, calculus or maybe biology and not just the simple Krebs cycle. Did you catch a little sarcasm there? You know the Krebs cycle, it's not simple. But we're going even deeper than that. We're, we're talking about some really advanced stuff where we're going to try to make some serious changes and do some serious things. And what you have here is a description of Christianity. Now I want to break that down for you one more time. So what we have is Jesus' passion for each one of us. His love, His desire to take that which is spiritual and plant it in your heart so that those transformations that sometimes we just hear about become experiential instead of just a story we heard somewhere about somebody who did something. We want to understand that He paid the price 
This is that free scholarship, that absolute full paid 100%. It's, it's, uh, we don't have toll roads around here, but if you traveled, you bumped into them. Jesus is at the head of the toll road and he's going, yeah, you can get on the straight and narrow. I've already paid the toll for you. Come on, start traveling with me. This is, this is the kind of passion he has for us. Which is a little humbling, isn't it? I'm not about to tell you stories, but let's say it this way. You know your past, don't you? You know where you've been. You know what you've done. You know what you've thought. And yet he's still standing there saying, come on, I'm going to pay this all for you. I want you in on it. I want you on the straight and narrow road. And he's dedicated 100% into it. Somebody says, well, you know, you got to put a little skin in. Did Jesus put a little skin in? Jesus put it all in, right? Everything 100%. And again, this ain't kindergarten that we're doing. What we're doing in Christianity, and we'll have the straight and narrow way verse up here in a few moments because you can't do this sermon without the straight and narrow way verse. This is the toughest thing you will ever do. This is so important. This is so critical. This is going to determine whether you spend your eternity in glory. And I don't know how to describe that or I would. Are you going to spend your eternity in ruin and failure? This is how massively important this thing is. And it is tough. It is one of the toughest things you will ever do. It is going to be a fight. It is going to be a struggle. At times, it is going to be overwhelming. There are going to be times that you will be on your knees going, God, I don't think I can do this anymore. And he's going to tell you, in a sense, yeah, you got one more step in you. And if you can take that one more step, you'll see a little bit further. And you'll start to understand that you can have that experience in Christ that you heard your Aunt Mabel talk about or somebody else or you read about in a book and you say, I want that in my life. It's there, but it's tough, but it's free. Isn't that kind of odd? So read with me if you would. Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Have you encountered the whiny students? The ones that, this was probably me, <laughs> this is too hard. I don't get figuring out the square root of whatever. And then the next question was, when am I ever going to need to figure out the square root of anything in my life? Come to think of it, I don't think I've ever had to figure out the square root of anything in my life. But you know, you got the whiny students, you got the crybaby students. They just, they just want a passing grade. They want a free passing grade. They want to sit in their desk, play with their iDevice, iPhone, smartphone, whatever things are out there now, and there are more of those than I can begin to imagine. And they want to sit there and play all day, and the teacher come along and pat them on the head. You're such a good kid, you got an A today. I'm just come bumping up all the way to school, just bump away way all through the years, uh, and, and then get a career and be successful and live in a big, beautiful two, three-story house and drive nice cars and... Well, sit around and play PS4 again all day. I don't know. They're the whiny students that think Jesus is being mean. Well, I don't think Jesus is being mean, and that really goes a direction I don't want to go in this lesson, but there are those students who think it ought to be easier. Well, let's look at Matthew 7, 14. This is your difficult way, and it is difficult, and there are few who find it. Can I just make a real quick aside? How many times have you been to the funeral where the deceased didn't make it to heaven, according to the preacher or the family? I know of one funeral where that happened. I did not get to attend it. I know the minister. And the guy was a really sorry case of drug abuse and a lot of, there was, you know, it was just a really ugly, sad story and a, a very ugly end. And the preacher said to the family, look, you know, we can't just smooth all this over. Let's just tell the truth. Let's be honest and say, don't live this life because this life doesn't go where you want to go. You know, the family, I knew the father of the deceased better than I knew the deceased, agreed. And by all accounts, it was a wonderful, sobering service. Otherwise, what do we say? 
everybody's going. You know, everybody's going there. Now, let me make a little disclaimer. I'm not saying that the preacher at a funeral ought to be the judge and make those statements. But there are some times when that just needs to be said and the family needs to be on board. Success is not easy. I don't care what we're doing. It is not easy. If you want to be mediocre, you can be mediocre. That's fine. Mediocre is easy. Mediocre is first level. You don't have to take any stairs to get to mediocre. There's no elevator to mediocre. Mediocre is just everybody shows up. Mediocre is crowded like crazy because that's where everybody is. But if you want to experience success, then you have to do some things that are going to be hard and difficult, and you're going to have to consistently do them day after day, year after year. And you will eventually get there. So think about your boot camp example for a moment. So you, you get the recruits, they're fresh in the boot camp, they just got their new haircut. And the first thing the instructor says is, I want you to sit in this big lazy boy recliner. Here's your remote control. Here's the big screen TV. I'm going to come in and yell at you now and then, but just ignore me. And, and uh, we'll, we'll be sure you have plenty of iced tea. And then now and then we're going to give you some free promotions. How many of you want that military protecting your freedom? Military is rough. Military is hard to understand. I got to meet my son's drill instructor and he went to the Marines. And I'll just be up front with you. He was arrogant. He made me uncomfortable. I knew he wasn't going to hurt me, but I wasn't going to give him any reason to hurt me either. He was, a, he was a, just an odd kind of guy. But I always got this one point. That drill instructor is mean and arrogant and sometimes not so clear speech, if you know what I mean. As I thought he was, had my son's best interest in heart. And when he yelled at my son and cursed at my son and knocked my son over, put 70 pounds of weight on his back and said, jump into this 12 foot pool, get out of it and come back up. When he did all of those mean, ugly, harsh things, he was trying to prepare him for the day he would be deployed and possibly be on the front lines when people were trying to kill him. And he wanted that boy and every other one to have the ability to keep their head and come back to me and mama alive. Training's hard. Guess what? They charged my son to join the military, incidentally. It was F-R-E-E. -E. It was free to join. Come on down. And then it got tough. Let's think about athletes for a moment. I don't know any athletes. I'm not into sports. So when we talk this afternoon with Potluck, if you start talking about sports to me and I kind of glaze over and try to be polite and nod my head a little bit, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. I'm sorry. I just never went down that road. But in sports, I do understand that it takes training. It takes work. I heard stories of like LeBron James. He didn't sit around and eat potato chips and drink Diet Coke all day. He worked. He worked hard. After he had reached the pinnacle of excess, success, he kept working hard longer than anybody else. Athletes, they know that it's tough. And if you're going to succeed, you've got to work at it. Now let's come back to the school of Christianity, right? I want those experiences. I have heard of the peace that passes understanding, haven't you? You know, I've heard about this love and this family and all of this wonderful stuff. It's out there. I want to experience it. What do I have to do now? Christ said, I can do it. He said, it's free. You know, the tow road example, the free scholarship. He said, come on, get, get on board. Let, let's do this thing. But he can't just give it to you. There's no way. I had a lot of great teachers growing up. They were very patient. But one thing they could not do is magically open the top of my head and just pour the information in. If I was going to get it, I had to work. Even though public education is what? Free. And back then, everything was pretty much free. You showed up, brought your sack lunch, peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and the rest of it was free. But you still had to put in the work. And that's the point that so many people are missing in Christianity and grace. And that's the soft sell that's going on in a lot of places. God paid the price. You don't have to do anything. That's wrong. That's, that's where people are messing up. That's why I like the, the free scholarship analogy. Let me see if I can advance on here. We've already hit those, so let's go to here. So, if grace 
is like what a few of my friends suggest, that Jesus paid it all. And you don't have to do anything but sit back in the recliner, enjoy the ride into heaven. It's all done. Then, then why is there the verses like this? And we're going to run three or four of these verses right now. He who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. You see, the full scholarship and spirituality does not annul the cross carrying. It is a free opportunity to carry the cross, but it doesn't take the cross away. If it was that idea of grace that some people have, then there would be no cross to carry. If free was free 100% in absolutely every conceivable way that you can imagine, then there's no cross to carry. And yet Jesus said, you don't take up your cross and follow him, you're not worthy of him. This means you've got to study. And you've got to study hard. And you've got to study for this like you've never studied for anything in your life. Because if you don't get it, and I, I'm an advocate that it starts here in my understanding first. I, I want to grasp it, and then I want the emotions to follow. I don't want the emotions to lead because that's going to get me in trouble. But if I get a book, chapter, and verse foundation first, and then I have the emotions that follow behind it, now I'm doing good. Now i got something going on. But I'm going to have to study. I've got to get it into my ears. And, and at our place, we do annual Bible reading. We have a Bible app, and we encourage everybody to get on it. We've had up to... 36 people out of our 100 on it. And uh, we've been doing this for, I think, five years now, maybe four. And it's neat because I know what people do, and I do it myself. They go, I never read that before in there. And I know these people read it the year before and the year before and the year before. I started daily Bible reading many years ago, and I still do the same thing. I'll still come across a verse and go, whoa, I didn't see that one before. I don't know why it works that way. Now, I know at my age why it works that way. I'm forgetting what I read before. So that makes things even better. So when you have this full spiritual scholarship, it doesn't mean that you have an automatic passing grade and you get a free career to follow and you get to scoot all the way up to CEO or president of the company or something like that. Full scholarship means you have a free opportunity to get on board and, and do some learning. Matthew seven fourteen again, it's a straight and narrow road. If grace were all smooth and easy, then why is there a straight and narrow road? Why is there any difficulty at all? The idea of no cross, no narrow way, no sacrifice. Brother, that's not in the Bible. That is a misconception that grew out of, I, now my history might be a little wrong, but I, I think Calvin and, and all that stuff back there, I think they started taking it too far in a push against the Catholic Church and we don't even try to go down that avenue right now. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your body a living sacrifice. Now that verse is pretty profound, but actually it's the next verse that is more profound, being transformed, having your mind renewed. You've got to quit thinking like the world thinks. See, that's that secular path that I said there at the very opening. You have two basic paths, secular and you have spiritual. You can't think like the world thinks. Let me try to word it this way. You can't use broad road thinking to travel the straight and narrow road. It's not going to work, and it's never going to work, except there are a lot of folks that want to try to make it work, and there are some folks out there that will sell you on it and go, oh, yeah, this will work, and they'll sell you anything you want in the name of religion, in the name of Christianity. Now, I definitely won't go into it, but in the perfect obvious example, what about homosexuality? The Bible's pretty clear on that, right? I think it's 1 Corinthians 6, 9. And yet, what do some churches teach you about homosexuality? You can find anything, anything with somebody holding a Bible and going, yeah, you can smoke weed. God made weed. Weed's good. Go ahead. You can find anything out there and it'll be called Christianity. That's why you've got to know the book. You've got to put in some time. 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20. Um, it's, a, it's a warfare. And also, some people have suffered shipwreck. Now, if this modern concept that some of your friends may hold about grace, where Christ paid everything, you can't do anything, you do anything, you just annulled the grace of God, that concept, then how in the world could you ever make shipwreck? How could it be straight and narrow, so on and so forth? So, you have this one, Galatians 5, 4, you become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified. How could you do that? Well, the reason that's possible is the full scholarship is the analogy 
does not mean the student doesn't have to study. It doesn't mean the student does not have to put in some time, burn some midnight oil, and, and that, that kind of thing. So we're going to have some intense focus here, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. This ought to just scare the socks off of you. Think about this. Paul, who, I think it's Acts 19, I can't remember my exact verse. They said he did miracles that were unusual. Now, I'm sorry, if I saw one miracle, that'd be really woo, out there, right? And now Paul's doing miracles that the people who had seen miracles said, whoa, but we had never seen any miracles like this. Isn't that amazing? So I've got Paul now who had his Damascus Road experiences. He's done things that you and I can't imagine. Think 2 Corinthians 12 and some of that stuff there maybe. And then now he's saying, I discipline my body. I bring it into subjection. Lest when I taught others, I myself should be disqualified. So we're going to have some very intense focus True spirituality is not only Sunday morning. Sunday morning and Bible classes are part of it, but that's not the whole thing. And that, I think some people miss that one. You know, they think, well, I show up on Sunday. What else do they want? Let me tell you what else God wants. He wants it all. He wants your heart, your mind, your soul, your time, everything that constitutes you. He wants it focused on Him. Loyal to Him. I believe that's on the banner right behind me that you all have had up here for quite some time. Love the Lord your God with what? Yeah. That's what God's looking for. So we have this 1 Corinthians 9, 27, and, and it's tough. We have this wonderful gift of salvation, but at the same time, you've got to work. Now, when I say that, and we're talking about a scholarship, so take, take your kid, your grandkid, I'm thinking grandkids, of course, and they get a full scholarship to whatever college. They even get their room and board paid. I mean, they've got one free ticket. And I say to my granddaughter or grandson, now, honey, you get there, don't you get distracted by all the entertainment. If you're going to be a whatever, you're going to have to study. And what if my grandkid would look at me and go, but I got a free scholarship. I don't have to do nothing. <laughs> we would laugh. But in Christianity, we actually have people that make that argument. Jesus paid it all. I don't have to do anything. That's wrong, folks. That's just flat out wrong. So you're going to get your yes buts. They're always there. One of my, can, can I call it rules of life? I don't have many. But to every argument, there is a counter argument. Now, I'm not saying the counter argument is always reasonable, rational, logical, or correct, but every argument has a counter argument. Really quick example. Talk about stacking the Supreme Court. One side of the political group is irate and upset. The rebuttal to that is, no, 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 we're not stacking it, we're unstacking it. Now, whether that's logical or not is beside the point. It illustrates the point. No matter what you say, somebody can go, uh-huh, yes, but. There's not a way to stop that. That one's always going to be there. That's humanity. What we're doing with the Bible is not a fun with Dick and Jane reader. I actually had one of those. I remember being in first grade in Texarkana, Arkansas, with my C. Dick kicked the ball. C. Jane catch the ball. And I was just elated that I could read. I think Mama was too. I was a little bit rowdy. In 2 Timothy 2.15, he says, Study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, folks, this takes tremendous amount of time. And I'm afraid what happens with so many of us is we think, well, I can come to Airport Loop. Wayne studies, I'm going to say 40 hours a week, maybe 60. Us preachers, we... We put in a crazy amount of time because we love what we're doing. And so we put in all this time and then we get up here and we distill all of that 30, 40 hours a week into, I've had it so easy during COVID, one lesson. You get 30 minutes. That's about all my members are going to take from me. And so they get 30 minutes and they're like, whoo, I've been fed. I'm out of here. Whoo, let's go. Where do you want to go eat lunch? And they're done. And yet I send my children and my children send my grandchildren to kindergarten, even pre-K in one case, and they go through 12 years of public school. Now, with kindergarten and pre-K, that is 13 to 14 years of educational effort just to get 
a high school diploma. And then my other grandson, who's a radiology tech, he did some more years at the local college and can still do some more years. Some kids on average do four years, so we got 13 plus four, is that 17? Told you I was a rowdy kid in school. And then we get maybe another four years, which gets us up to 21 years of educational activity so that we can go get a job, which eventually we're not going to like, but that's another story. So we can get up, eat breakfast, go to work, come home, complain, go to bed, get up, eat breakfast, go to work, come home. And we spent 21 years, maybe, if you're a doctor, to be able to do that. And then we come to church and go, Wayne, well, you got 30 minutes, but don't push it along, buddy. Because I got some place to go. And you're supposed to fill me up. And, 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 and I'm, and I'm going to leave here with a peace that passes understanding. And this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. And I'm like Paul and going, man, I want to be over there with Jesus. I'm going to stay here for a while because that's beneficial. But man, would I love to go. And it's to be the sincerest desire of your heart. You're not going to get that in a week. Conversion enthusiasm is fun. If you remember yours, it's a delight. But it wanes. And then there's the long, hard grind that goes year after year. You stumble, you get up, you stumble. As you get back up muscle a whole lot and you get better at it and you keep going. Or as uh, one guy said, you fall forward. And you keep falling forward. I don't have a problem with anybody falling. Fall forward. Nobody bats a thousand. But it's hard stuff. And it's frustrating at times. So, number one complaint I get. Of course, I, I harp, if I harp, I harp on daily Bible reading. That's, that's my longest, most consistent harp. And now and then somebody will go, but I don't understand what I read. Now, what I politely say is just keep reading it, you will. What I'm thinking is, well, what would you expect? The first time I went into first grade and they had that big row of ABCs all displayed over the chalkboard. And this had been about 1964, I guess. And there were 26 of them. And they told me I was going to learn each and every one of them. And then later on, they pulled this real nasty trick, teaching us how to te count by twos and fives. Wow, what a challenge. Oh, I was frustrated. I couldn't ever do that. Finally did. Finally did a whole lot of things. Because part of the educational process, the first thing you experience is frustration and overwhelm. You're a new Christian. Here's your Bible. There's only like 1,258 pages in it. And it's divided up into these various categories. And primarily you're interested in the New Testament. But you really ought to have the Old Testament because it gives you some good feel for what's in the New Testament. Yada, 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 so on and so forth. And all those crazy names that I still cannot pronounce. You have all that stuff in there. And we think, well, I'll bring my kids to Bible class. They got 30 minutes once a week. Why aren't they doing better? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. If you want to experience those things that may just be a little mythic, mythic to you. So let, I'm going to look at two categories of yes buts. We'll hit these pretty quick and then we'll call it a day because I do see the clock. I think I made it past 25 minutes, so we're doing good. I was told I was in trouble if I went under 25. Of course, I'm a preacher. What preacher's doing under 25 nowadays? I'll keep you to 35. So I've told somebody now that faith, excuse me, grace is like a scholarship. And it's absolutely free, but you've got to work, you've got to burn the midnight oil, you've got to get in there and hit it, and you're going to have to do it year after year after year. If you're going for your doctorate, we're talking, you know, 21 years to use the educational analogy, and so you've got to, you've got to get in there and it's going to be tough. There are going to be times you want to quit. And so they throw up Romans 4, 1 through 4, right? What shall we say that Abraham our father is found according to the flesh for Abraham if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And out of him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but debt. And then you get, aha, gotcha, preacher. No, you didn't. Remember, this isn't the fun with Dick and Jane Reader, right? So I, he's got his club, his Romans 4, 1 through 4. 
I got my club too. I'm going to pull out my golf club, my baseball bat or whatever. And look, let, let me just drop down to verse 24. You see that a man is justified by works and not faith only. The only place the term faith only occurs in the Bible to the translations I'm familiar with, and it says not by faith only. So now I've got my verse, he's got his verse, and we keep trying to beat each other up with verses. Folks, don't do that. That's bad stuff. So are Paul and James in disagreement? Paul in Romans 4 is very, very clearly saying, no, I, I do wages. And then over here, James is saying very clearly, not by faith only. You see, by works a man is justified. And you go, what, what's, what's going on? Okay, this isn't a fun and dick Jane reader. This is study to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. This isn't going to be done by memorizing John 3.16 or Acts 2.38. This is going to take a lot of work and a lot of effort. But the answer is, this is just like a scholarship, guys. Here's what I'm suggesting to you, and I think this, this is sound. What you have in Romans chapter 4, verse 1 through 4, is Paul talking about the free part. And a scholarship has the free part. That's the part up front. Or as I said a while ago, Jesus paying the toll so you can get on the straight and narrow road. That's the free part. James is talking about now that you're in college and you're enrolled, you better get to work. You better focus. You better keep your attention and you better stay till you get to the end. And for you and I, that's Revelation 2.10, be thou faithful unto death. There's Now, you see how now I don't have scriptures fighting each other. I have scriptures working together, just like a hand in glove. I can get this with a scholarship, no problem. I can understand this with the military, no problem. I can understand this with athletics, no problem. We watched that football movie not too long ago about the guy who did the walk on and made the team. So he had a free opportunity, right? And then they about wore him out training. We get it there. And then we get over into religion and go, oh, no, 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 yes. It's just like that. Let's give you one more. This is Ephesians 2, verse 8, 9, and 10. So he says, by grace you've been saved, not, not of yourself. It's a gift of God, not a works, lest anyone should boast. And then he tells us that we were created for God, or his, we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So is Paul talking out of both sides of his mouth? He's got verse 8 and 9, not of works. Don't want anybody boasting. Verse 10, he says, but you were created for good works. What's going on here? Okay, snowball analogy. Don't do this in religion. Now, most of us have been guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. So uh, here's what happens. My, my friends who are more into the grace-only thing will grab John 3.16. That's their club, right? Their bat. And they start beating me with it. And I run over to my Acts 2.38. And I grab my club. And now we have a match going on to see who can beat each other up with their Bible verse. Do you see the problem inherent in that? God is not the author of confusion. So if I'm using a verse trying to beat down your verse, something's wrong. Somewhere in there we need to call a truce and wait, go, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. This isn't right. God's not the author of confusion. I know you've got a set of verses you're looking at, and I've got a set of verses I'm looking at, but at some level they fit together perfectly 100% without any contradiction. Let's look for that place. That's a rare person who's going to want to look for that place, but you can do it in your own study and your own heart. But anytime I'm trying to beat a verse with another verse, something, something wrong. We need to put them both on the table. And then bring some more verses on the table uh, and start figuring it out. So our answer with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10, is it's like the scholarship. What you have is you have verse 8 and 9. That's the free part. And it is absolutely there. And verse 10 is the working part. There's your study. There's your straight and narrow. There's your carry your cross. There's your I discipline my body, lest I myself be disqualified. Don't make shipwreck of the faith. That's the second part. That's all in there. It's one package. And it's a mistake to try to divide it up and act like though it is exclusively one or the other. It is not exclusively one or the other. 
Last verse, Matthew 7, 21. My daughter said she's putting this on my tombstone. So I'll be dead. That'd be fine. I like this verse. So Christ said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, are in the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Is Christ violating grace? I mean, how could you say it any more clearly? But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Then he goes on to illustrate it there, and you can read the next two verses later on. Obviously, Christ is not violating grace. That would be absurd. Everybody's welcome. But then you've got to do your part. Everybody is responsible. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Free part, then our part. Free part, our investment. Free part, our walk, our journey, our cross, our study, our everything else. Very last slide, I promise you. A full scholarship does not exclude us doing the work that we're supposed to do. Christ did his part. God did his part. It's all been provided. Now it's time for us to do our part. And I'm just going to close by asking you quite simple. Are you doing your part? If you are, hang in there. That's awesome. If you're not, it's time to make a change. If you're ready to make a public change, let us help you. While together we stand and sing.